think you'd better do what he says, Mr. Kenny. You have 60 seconds to comply. This is minute three. Part man. Part machine. All part. This minute begins with the artificial heart transplant commercial and ends with the exterior shot of the Detroit precinct. I think we've got some different syncing issues. Yeah, I'm watching it on stand, so I don't know if that's... Oh, I've, I'm watching the DVD cut up into tiny little pieces and rendered out. Minute pieces. My version starts with uh, three dead police officers and ends with one of the great first jokes of this entire movie, which is attempted murder. It's not like he killed someone. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, technically ends with, it's a clear violation of my client's civil rights, but I love that. This is when I'm rewatching it, it's like, oh my god, I've forgotten just how fucking funny this movie is. Yeah. First minute, third minute. Third minute, and I think, well, okay, before we get into it, uh, our, our top priority is to bring you the latest in Robocop news. <laughs> The Robo News. The Robo News. This is Media Break. You give us three minutes and we'll give you the world. And apparently there is a new prequel series in the works, which will be focusing on Dick Jones. Oh, wow. Cool. And well, I guess I don't know when this is going out, so you might already know about it. But I, I think it's worth us just keeping on top of these things and reacting to it. As much as we can. Yeah. And, well, first of all, my first thought is, okay, so we're going to get at least a season of actors having to use the name Dick without a trace of irony. (laughs) Sign me up. (laughs) It's Richard Jones. In fact, Dick is my father. (laughs) Yeah. And when you read the title or the headlines, I just go, oh, yeah, how is that going to work? What are they thinking? And then when I think it's either the showrunner or one of the writers talks about their their plan for it they go you know imagine it's going to be this breaking bad style fall from grace anti-hero story and it's more about criticizing corporate culture and late stage uh, capitalism yeah that's well that's pretty much what robocop the first movie is part of the meta narrative is it's basically poking fun at corporate america i'm wondering if you could have some transhumanist stuff in there as well you know robocop didn't come out of nowhere the technology must have been in the works well yeah i mean that's the thing is bob norton is basically at the start of this movie he's got everything already planned so you could even have young bob norton peppered in there you know maybe this hostility between the two that we'll see in like two or three minutes Mm. maybe that is something that developed early on when you know bob was a literal rookie in the company yeah no one decides a human robot in like two weeks Mm. they had to have a lot of this stuff i mean even if it's one of those things where they just cribbed it from um, ed 209 you know like okay they they've developed this big ass chunky robot that can do all this kind of stuff what happens if we take that and make it a bit smaller because we definitely we've got to have the cyberpunk in the one of the classic cyberpunk stories you can't just put it in a contemporary modern world what is the point (laughs) well there's even even if you go back to say robocop 2 the idea of um the test subjects you know murphy was kind of this thing that uh we'll we'll definitely talk about it later on but there's a line in the movie where bob norton through ocp has been setting up cops in different districts where there's a very good chance that they're going to get murdered so we can Mm. have good test candidates for the robocop program yeah and uh, well in this minute we find out that OCP funds and runs the police. So it's a privatized police force. And that is terrifying. Horrific. I mean, you know, things aren't much better in America right now, but again, it's amazing how prescient. Yeah. The story is. I think that's a good way to describe Robocop. Again, that's why I love this film. It it just keeps coming back, which is kind of scary that shit, this keeps on coming back. And that's what fascinates me about the cyberpunk genre in Mm. general is that so... It technically begins with uh, Neuromancer in... uh, It's a book written in, I think, the early 80s. You know, the funny thing is, until you literally just said that, my brain was like going, I never considered Robocop to be part of the cyberpunk genre, but it fits so well. Oh, absolutely. Dystopian future. It's the cop cyberpunk. What the hell? Yep. Nice. And I actually don't think Neuromancer's that good in terms of... It's kind of fledgling. So it's like trying to watch Halloween now when the (laughs) slasher genre is well and truly dead. Uh, I 
I kind of still like Halloween. I like my slashes, but I also am a sucker for like slow burn horrors, mm. which is spoilers. Kind of a bit what New Mutants is like. It's not, you know, it's not jump scary like the modern day horror genre, which I think is why a lot of people didn't like it. But I kind of came to the genre backwards because, you know, there was Freddy yeah. and Jason and yeah, Evil was Dead and all that sort of stuff. And mm. then I watched Halloween and just went, but where's the twist? You know, where's the other thing on top of it? Oh, and uh, Scream. Forgot to mention that one. Definitely that. If you've watched Scream and then you go to Halloween, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I think that could be uh, not, not an issue with you necessarily, but like the idea, I think like horror in a post screen world is probably going to be weird in that sense of, mm. I enjoy Scream. Oh, uh, yeah. The sequels, not so much. No. <laughs> uh, I just, I, I found them diminishing returns, to be perfectly honest. It's like, yeah, it's the same gimmick. Literally, you both Kramer, it's the same gimmick you did in the last freaking nightmare film and then scream got parodied so many times in so yeah. many different things to the point now where i'm sitting here going have i actually seen scream or am i just imagining i <laughs> have i seen scream or have i seen scary movie <laughs> basically <laughs> but um yeah so neuromance is kind of yeah. like that in terms of this is what created the genre therefore mm. there aren't any twists there aren't any th- there's nothing i haven't seen before because yeah. this was the foundation so it's weird when you think of foundational works like that isn't it but ridley scott i think <laughs> pretty much solidified yes i always talk about my, my man ridley uh, yeah, scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but he pretty much solidified the visual aesthetics i think um hmm. which is in of course blade runner which yeah. then japan fell in love with ran with that aesthetic for all these decades you can find it throughout anime mm. and manga pretty much to this day well that was also social commentary on the idea of the 80s consumerism and like mm. the love of japan or at least japan made electronics and how mm. there was that fear of the invasion of japan through consumer culture at that time Again, yeah. like all good sci-fi, it is social commentary. Yeah, and it's funny, those references now, like yeah. Back to the Future, Doc is worried about Japanese technology. And it's just yeah. Like, oh, is that a thing? And now it's all Chinese crap. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's always been the fun of any kind of science fiction looking forward. It always has to look forward from the present. I mean, yeah, okay, that's a very redundant statement. Cause... But it's one of those things that it's it's so obvious that it kind of needs to be stated because yeah. you have to, because I think most people do watch science fiction and sometimes they go, well, God, this is so dated. Yeah, but you got to take it within yeah. its context. Well, even in the previous minutes with the whole thing of the heart, you know, there's a Yamaha reference. It's already peppering in Japanese consumer electronic uh, production. Mm. I'm going to skip very quickly to uh, our gaslighting section. Not really. But <laughs> even the Monday version talks about, and I think they, they honestly did get this right, talking about the Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, mm. cult of personality, American consumerism, which I yeah. actually think, as much as I don't like that film, I think that was on point. Yeah, I think... Robocop does that American consumerism quite yeah. well in, in, in the original. Especially that kind of like 80s wolf and sheep kind of bad metaphor because I'm thinking of Wolf of Wall Street immediately. But the idea of like the corporate America and they're all out to get each other and the mm. rah, rah, rah kind of environment that bred. But we do get our first corporate mention in this minute. Mm. Um, but also thing about Cyberpunk is that it's really interesting that it fell out of popularity during the 2000s thousands you know the matrix was probably the matrix is cyberpunk but it's it's very much its own yeah, i think it probably fell out of popularity after the 80s and i think matrix probably gave it that resurgence yeah true however briefly yeah so the 80s was really the heyday and then nothing mm-hmm. until now and even things like cyberpunk itself was a great cr- criticism on capitalism yeah and there's a lot of think pieces out there on it and i think they're right that it's surprising to see that we are living basically in the cyberpunk future this is Mm. everything that we read about and watched and yet we are drawn to this genre because it's actually allowing us to confront these things quite directly so something like mr robot Mm. i mean that show is incredible if you haven't watched it just freaking do it it's been on my list what's so incredible about that show is that it is cyberpunk 
joke, but it's not fantasy. It's not mm. science fiction. It is using very real technology. That's the fascinating thing is cyberpunk is now. Mm. You don't need to make anything up unless you're doing, you know, specifically transhumanist discussion. But even then, I think there's room for that in a modern setting. You say that, which is interesting, especially concerning uh, Mr. Robot. It's been a while since I've delved into the hacker culture history stuff like that i wish there was like a book on it because yeah it is very fascinating stuff yeah god i can't remember last i read up on this stuff but like you look at the late 90s early 2000s like dawn of the internet Mm. kind of hacker culture and no the movie hackers is not a uh, accurate <laughs> representation <No. laughs> at least in parts I, I don't know if you know that but i actually end up doing the book was better of the hackers i remember that no i kind of have this love-hate relationship with that damn movie yeah <laughs> <laughs> i love it i hate this movie so much but but like the whole idea that there was this kind of cyber warfare it's still going on to a certain degree, but there's this kind of like cyber warfare that was going on behind the scenes that no one really knew about, particularly like the white hats versus the black hat stuff. Like mm. this is when governments were having to kind of realize, holy shit, we've got this thing called the internet and there is ways for now for people to be able to breach into computer systems remotely. So it became this huge thing and there was a... Yeah, they just did not understand what they were dealing with. And, and yet you had these don't. like 14 year old kids who yeah. wielded the power of gods. Like that thing at the beginning of Hackers where um, Johnny Lee Miller's character, as a kid, he hacked into, I think it was a banking system with nothing but like a phone and a PC. Yeah. And he, that was based on a real case that actually mm. happened and like caused some shenanigans. I mean, there was even, I think it was like you had a whistle and blew that into a phone. and Yeah, that, freaking. Yeah, freaking. That's what I was. So you could hack even with just a phone. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, if you had a touch tone phone or something like that, you could you know, use a series of repeated button presses to trick the computers on the other end because they were kind of also very primitive as well, you know? Mm. It's also, it's very amazing. And I'm, I would love to see a docudrama or all this, but it'd probably be very boring. It shouldn't be. It's a very fascinating subject. It's a fascinating subject, but I just think cinematographically, it probably would not be good to see because it'd just be some, like, you know, bunch of 14 year olds drinking a lot of Coke and maybe popping some, like, caffeine <laughs> pills, you know, typing away. And I'm sorry, I don't like the whole the screen mirrors onto the face bullshit. Well, yeah, you'll definitely like Mr. Robot because they have a way of really integrating. <laughs> typing into the story and the way they just depict technology it's just it's genius it's absolutely my favorite thing of hackers the movie in its entirety is that one of the um corporate security technicians that uh, that's uh, hired by fisher stevens is played by pen gillette of pen and tele fame <laughs> a man who famously knows nothing about computers <laughs> amazing i don't know how people live without technology yeah but it's gone to the point now where the word hacking just means technology I saw an article, you know, I woke up one morning, I'm just going through all the news headlines and it's like, girl hacked some gas station employee to death. I'm like, what do you mean hacked to death? Like, how do you, oh, with an axe, like hacking, like, uh, yeah, chopped to death. They use firex.exe. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> what boomer fucking wrote this? Hacking. <laughs> <laughs> That's not hacking. Tying it back into uh, the, the subject of this podcast, the, there is a lot of science fiction like mm. deus ex i never asked for this where cyborgs are hacked into and i'm wondering if that would really be the case and if well it's, it's always an arms race you know yeah. that if you cr create better security then the hackers will figure it out and then you got to create more security and so on and so forth this is why patch upgrades are a real thing that's a culture that comes back from the unix days where microsoft and i'm not sure about apple but definitely microsoft were just like no nah, no nah, we don't need to patch this stuff and unix just like oh we found a security hole patched and we just send everyone unix? else the free packs yeah that's their name yeah <laughs> you, okay so you have linux is a derivative of unix oh because i I know Linux, yeah. Linux is just the popular version of Unix. Unix is the base system, of course. Why Unix... would they call it a Unix? <laughs> U-N-I-X. I don't care. I don't <laughs> care how they spell it. It's about Unix. It's about not having a full set down there. <laughs> Sorry, I am now 
googling because i want to see yeah it came up from the 70s and i'm just trying to know if there was actually a thing for the name probably isn't but uh yeah. why basically why? unix was like an open source uh, operating system and that's why it became it was one of the first i think a service server client uh systems mm. as well so it became very popular among servers it did eventually become open source but i'm not entirely sure when i'm hazy with all this stuff i've known programmers all my life well, all my adult life, and they know more about this shit than I. I was the graphic design kid at, with a bunch of hmm. code monkeys, so you know they were constantly asking me to draw things for their games, and then they go, "Say, what do you want me to draw? Just draw something." No, oh, I hate what? That. What do you want me to draw? Do you want me to draw land? Yeah, draw land. Okay, what setting is this? Yeah, my mom was always like, "Draw a birthday card for your grandfather. What should it be? Just draw something." Uh... <laughs> yeah, but that is at least a little bit of a clue because you go draw a birthday card. No, I say you maybe want to draw a cake with candles. Okay, that's a birthday thing. This is like I'm making a game. Draw something for me. What's the game? I don't know. Draw something for me. Is it a shooter? Do I need to draw is it a fantasy? Is it? A... <laughs> yeah. Do I need to draw a gun? Do I need to draw a person? Do I... No, just draw something. Oh, I hate you so much. <laughs> I always troll people like that. So in that situation, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to draw some kind of like Legend of Zelda shit. And if it's not a fantasy, well, tough titties. Well, the funny thing is nowadays adult me would probably just draw a giant penis and say, there you go. <laughs> a dick butt. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I've just seen be your game, but I don't care. This is what you get when I, you just say, draw anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did what you told me. Well, I drew something. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you didn't say, you didn't not specify that it had to have a penis. So this minute has the introduction of Clarence Boddicker, played by Kurtwood Smith. And I knew him first as Red from that yeah. 70s show, and I'll never not see him as... I have the complete opposite, because I knew Kurtwood Smith as Clarence Boddicker before anything else yeah. he ever did. Yeah, it's a weird generational thing. It's the same thing with the neuromancer situation. So like it all always matters what you see first. That's just you cannot change That's it. it. I was just gonna say, um, I believe Dick Jones was introduced first because there's that actual little interview segment with him. Yes. Where he says, "You can't stand here. You better stay out of the kitchen." Oh yeah, because I mentioned uh, the OCP funds the police, yeah. but then we just went on a tangent because well, <laughs> it's this fucking show. No, that's cool. I just think that these two are the best characters in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. They, they're having the best time. I'm having to call it Todd Clarence now and go back to Dick. Yeah, because he is also in Star Trek. I don't know if we mentioned that before, but he, he is an a admiral. Oh, uh, shock no, and no. surprise. Uh, uh, Ronnie Cox is not an admiral. He's a captain. Oh, is he captain? He is Captain Jellico. Oh, Captain Jellico. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Who takes over command of the Starship Enterprise NCC 1701-D. Oh, 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 fuck me. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like I came prepared. Uh, no, and here's the funny thing is, Kurtwood Smith has also appeared in Star Trek. Yeah, I was looking that up and I just noticed and just went, well, I see there's a trend here. And another person in this movie also has appeared in Star Trek. It's almost like there's a connection. And in the second movie, there is a slick back. Yeah. <laughs> Kurtwood Smith actually plays a Cardassian by the name of Anorax. And he also plays another character called Thrax. He's played two aliens, so he's wore a lot of loaf for Star Trek. Oh, I'd love to do Kardashian makeup. Yeah. They're just, they're so handsome. I might actually do this in real life. I want to cosplay as a, the engineer race. Uh, they're one of the three, four founders, the uh, Tellarites. I want to cosplay as a Tellarite. Oh, right. So I want to wear a lot of face loaf. And that way I can still have my beard. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I can see the them big now. big jowls. That was terrifying. Yeah. I want to play a Tellarite. They're kind of grumpy and cool. I know I would be a great Ferengi. Yeah. We were talking about Clarence Boddicker and Dick Smith. Dick Jones. So Smith and Jones. Dick, that would be a good uh, combination. Dick Smith and Dick Jones. Like the, the good capitalist and the bad capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a buddy cop show. I, I think Ronnie Cox would be down for that. Yeah. What's he doing now? Can't be much. I have no idea. So Clarence has apparently killed 31 police officers and, well, we later, I don't think it's a spoiler, we find out that he is working with Dick Jones. So yeah, it, it, the whole thing is orchestrated, which I didn't even really think about until now, you know, when you watch a movie so closely, you just go, oh, right. Yeah, of course, it's already broadcasting everything you need to know about the plot in this first few minutes. Yeah. The setup of this movie is quite well done. Mm. It just peppers in all that information, especially in that boardroom scene. And it, it flies by just fast enough that you 
get a sense of what's going on, but you really don't really know what's going on. Yeah, because I think when I write, or a lot of people have, have this, where you're trying to reveal mm. things without revealing too much up front, but this no, this this hits that perfect mid ground where foreshadowing. it's foreshadowing, but it's not in your face. It, like it goes by so quickly, you just go, oh yeah, okay. Just a quick tangent. One of the things I love about uh, New Mutants is there's a, some lovely bits of foreshadowing in there, and I'm not, I won't oh, yeah. spoil it for you. And oh, so good. I, I love a good foreshadow. But if you're watching this for the first time and you are taking this information in, you'd probably think, oh, okay, so Clarence and Dick Jones are probably enemies because one owns the police, yeah. one's been killing police, but no, nah, no. Nah. That's a good reveal later on in the film. Spoils if you haven't seen it. Mm. If you haven't seen the movie, why are you watching it minute by minute? I'm sorry. They introduce our two main antagonists within the first three minutes of this film, and they set them up on both sides of the law. And I think that's the cool thing about Dick Jones in this film is that you know he's a person you don't want to fuck with. I don't want to say a badass or anything like mm. that, but in the corporate world, he is the second biggest dick in the room, while simultaneously still being the biggest dick in the room. Yeah. The, his yeah. <laughs> dick-swinging privileges are pretty much everyone but the old man. Yes. He's very well-named. He is well-named. Actually, while we're talking about the introduction, so yes, the news break talks about how Clarence Brodicker is a cop killer, setting up the confrontation mm. between him and uh, Alex Murphy within like the next, geez, like almost like five minutes. It runs by so quickly in this film, which is good. Mm. Okay, so we've talked in previous minutes about how New Media Break was not originally going to be the beginning of this film. What was going to be the beginning of this film was going to be the actual shootout between Clarence Brodica and the four cops that he kills three of them and leaves Frank alive. Good luck, Frank. You're going to need it. Hmm. And it was actually going to be this big shootout. It was going to be the big action scene to open up the film. Yeah. In the commentary, Ed Newmyer basically turns around and says that it was a staple of an 80s film, so they thought it'd be funnier to just not do it. I actually generally don't like opening on an action sequence because you're just like, who are these people? Why do I care? None of this is earned yet. I think the exceptions being if it's in a big franchise like the Abrams Star Trek movies did that Badly. a lot, and uh, <laughs> the, oh, I don't know. I kind of like some of those away missions. The the the, the one with uh, the scuba outfits. You sink a starship in a pre-warp civilization that hadn't learned astronomy. They're not going to look up into the science. See the. Th Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Just in terms of, like, getting you swept up in the action stuff, yeah. you already know who these characters are. Same thing with mm. the MCU movies. Like, I think Captain America Winter Soldier opens perfectly because mm. it's a lot of character while it's also this mission that's sneaking aboard mm. the ship. You can do that if we know who these characters are. But if we don't, don't throw me into the deep end like that. So it's called In Media Res. It's the idea of you're starting in the middle of a scene. Really just great for action scenes. If you're doing something character-driven, you really do need to establish the character. I think in this mm. case, it being an action film, really, let's just be honest, it is an action film. As much as we talk about the social commentary and all mm. that type of stuff, it is an action film. This is perfectly fits into the schlocky yeah. 80s action genre. Starting off the way it does is a great subversion for that. Yeah, it actually really works for me. And, uh, well, uh, going over into Gaslighting <laughs> Robocop. Alex, how do you feel? I feel fine, Dr. Norton. I've been thinking really hard about this. You know, we've been talking about roughly the same thing for the, the past few episodes yeah. about this opening, and I'm just trying to figure out why doesn't this work? Because honestly, when I look at this minute for mm. the original Robocop, you know, the stuff that we're being told about is pretty disturbing. Uh, well, you know, things like the using atomic weapons on civilians, privatized military police forces i mean that feels mm. immediate and urgent and, and real i guess i don't know maybe the problem is that we've had this american military presence mm. in the middle east in this movie yeah. it's iran for so long especially someone my age you know post 9 11 this has just been reality yeah it's just normalcy yeah and, and it's this distant country i've never been to don't know anything about i don't feel anything i mean and also the way it's done is very over the top but that's neither here nor there so being the poor schlub who's having to rewatch these damn minutes of this damn film i i, I secretly love hmm. it no i don't i just want to say that for any future blackmail attempts <laughs> yes i'm doing this of my own free will no um <laughs> I think one of the reasons why I'm actually partially wanting to re-examine 
this abomination of a great film is because I want to try and get an understanding of what the hell happened here. Because there's some good ideas. Yeah, I I really love that we're comparing the two. So rewatching this, the beginning intro for these few minutes, the information that the new movie tells us that the old one doesn't it's almost pure exposition and it's setting up the premise mm. of the argument for robocop it's this whole idea of we america are policing the entire world with drones why can't we do it in america that is f- almost mm. five minutes of movie i summed up to you in a sentence it just drags this yeah. exposition so okay so my line for the gaslighting of robocop section is sam jack's praising fascism Plus the first mention of ED-209. That's pretty much it. Yes. Because I think the drone stuff is next minute. I wrote, we should probably have the, uh, <laughs> so this minute begins with Pat Novak, Sam Jackson, asking in the general, what are these colored dots? And ends with Rick Maddox, Jackie Earl Haley, leading the news reporter into the field. And I have to say, Jackie Earl Haley, always given his best. He's a great actor and he's... I think he is a good actor. I just think he's just kind of been typecast into this role and I think that's just that's wrong with some of the things wrong with robocop as well there's no true antagonist except for this douchebag with a gun that likes to heckle robocop yeah and i tend to like stories that don't have a defined antagonist that's not the main problem of this movie well yeah i mean the problem is that we finally get the antagonist of the movie in the robocop remake literally right at the end the dick jones reveal happens in like the last 10 minutes yeah Ah! yeah isn't it funny that this opening scene would have been way more expensive than the one in the original Robocop. And it does a worse job of conveying the same message. That's what, uh, going back to the good media break, the media break we all know and love. They, they talk about war and everything, mm. but it's also, because it's done in such a good reflection of news journalism, it's, it's just kind of thrown away that OCP owns the cops and then they just cut to the uh, the obligatory, hey, let's go to our corporal overlords and so they can just reassure us that they're doing the good job. And then, by the way, here's a cop killer. The, the news broadcast exposition is definitely a trope it is a cliche and yet actually i think i did bring this up on my other podcast but tropes and cliches work when you do them well yeah this absolutely set a tone sets a vibe for this movie that's really effective whereas i just i'm so indifferent to the remake opening and you know it's all these cgi drones and robots walking around (sighs) and you know i know the original robocop is not subtle but somehow the remake is an even bigger sledgehammer and we'll get more into this in the next few minutes it's just so cartoonishly over the top like the e the ed 209s ed 209s (laughs) whatever the fuck they are like you know we bring peace or remain peaceful some shit like i don't remember what they said i'll get to that when i actually review those minutes for my penance but here's a funny thing this movie is info dumping you all this stuff you need to know quickly but it's not in your face Mm. the dick jones mention really doesn't do anything in the context of this thing except to say in part the idea of ocp owning the cops you don't really know how important dick jones is but you kind of need to know who clarence boddicker is and why he is important because he is the cop killer Mm. so it's setting up the idea of the next time you see him and there's a cop around they're probably going to bite the bullet. Yeah. In Alex Murphy's case, almost literally. Just had another thought is the opening in the original movie, you said making the case for why Robocop would need to exist in this world. Mm. It's showing, you know, what this world is like and what the stakes are. Yeah. Whereas in the remake, it is some foreign country. We don't know how this applies to uh, America or Detroit specifically. Holy shit, there really is no stakes because they're talking about crime in the US. But then it's not seems mm. to be so over. <sighs> Fucking hell. Cinematography. Detroit in the original movie is mm. is grimy. It's usually shot at night, so it's dark and it's moody. Oh my god, yeah. The, oh, the, don't get me started. The Robocop remake looks so generic. It's in daylight! It's it's Detroit. Like, it should look like, like shit. it has a lot of character. It should look run down. It should look like shit. You know, <laughs> um, I will even give 
Detroit Become Human, the video game credit here, because their Detroit looks amazing. You know, it's it's futuristic. Yeah. It's looking at modern Detroit yeah. and then just adding more to it. And they managed to really capture the, the heart and soul of that mm. city. Well, do you know the irony is? In the mm. first Robocop movie, it wasn't shot in Detroit. It was shot in Dallas. Because yeah. I thought Dallas looked futuristic enough. <laughs> but it was still shot like you could tell that crime was rampant. The problem with the Robocop remake, it just looked like a suburb. It looked very clean and in a cyberpunk story the city should have a personality all of its own. You need dystopia. Yeah, it should, you know, I mean, same thing with Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, yeah. Akira, you know, all of those, mm. those cities have a very distinct look yeah. and they're a personality. I mean, even on something with a very, very small budget like Altered Carbon, mm. you know, they have managed to give that world yeah. a particular look that doesn't look like anything else. You don't have to literally throw trash on the street, even just, yeah, like shooting it at night, adding some mood. Neon lines some graffiti come on guys some rain or even gangs people that look like ruffians actually populate the freaking world i want to see robocop in the rain <laughs> robocop played by john cusack <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so there's low budget ways you can just add that in picture dimensionality and god damn it they don't do that in this remake Ah, can we talk about a good movie? Can we go back to Robocop? So, yeah, going back to uh, the original Robocop, my only note left was that we have a wipe to the Detroit Police Department, yeah. and it's it's very Robocop-esque. Mm. It's, uh, you know, all digital, well, hard to describe, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, in, uh, well, my, God, my version of the minute, uh, we actually, yeah, we see the inside, and what I like is how, even though it's set in the future, in big air quotes, I like the fact that the police precinct is this busy place and it's really informing the idea that the cops are overworked they're overrun and i love the desk chief lieutenant oh i can't think of his name i don't think his name is introduced in this minute regardless no he is the you you're a scumbag your class a scumbag and scumbags see the judge on ah no, can't think of the rest of it. I'll write it down for next minute. Yeah, storytelling through cinematography, through environment. How could you make a high-budget movie and not know this? I just... Oh. It's just so generic. I know. Ow, ow. <laughs> Say what you will about the tepid trash idea of Marvel and the factory system. Marvel still is a universe feels like its own universe mm -hmm. although the cinematography has some issues there but yeah at least you you know who 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 making it i'm lumping cinematography as both like not just camera movements and things like that. i'm also talking about environment uh, i should probably just say environmental storytelling visual style yeah visual storytelling yes mm. right it's easier to do visual storytelling when you're in the guardians of the galaxy mm. part of the galaxy yeah you know, it's yeah you know, when you're on mm. an alien planet and it's not just rocks and dust and clouds. You know, when you've actually got an alien environment, it adds so much dimension to a film when if they just shot that alien thing and it looks like a shopping mall, then what's the point? Mm. I mean, yeah, they kind of did that in Guardians, but even the futuristic shopping mall looked really futuristic because they added holograms. Yeah. So it could be San Francisco Earth in 2000 and... Uh, I'm trying to remember the star date. Oh, what is it? Uh, of 2009. Uh, 2300? Because they pretty much did that pretty much for... Um, Quick, open my fan fiction where I do actually talk about the years. Uh, particularly in Into Darkness more than... Oh, right, right. Of, uh, Well, you know, it's it's just... Well, even TNG shutting San Francisco and futuristic-looking buildings, like Injustice. That classic episode mm. <laughs> where they almost killed the boy. The boy. Oh, yes, that one, yep. How could I forget? Oh, <laughs> uh, how we try to forget. <laughs> I do think uh, visual storytelling is kind of one of my things. Like, I, I love talking about it. I kind of hate when it gets ruined. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that these days, that's what we're going to the cinema for. Yeah. And, I mean, that's what the medium's for. You know, it's a visual medium, so... Exactly. Why not give me something gorgeous and, and incredible to look at? I think we're, because we're now basically living in the Netflix era in many ways. So mm. well, what would have been probably movie projects are now being farmed out to Netflix. Major Hollywood studios now want to either produce two types of movies. They want to produce a $200 million budget blockbuster that rakes in a billion dollars, mm. Marvel. 
or they want to knock out something really cheap and shitty for maybe at most a hundred million, mm. throw it up on the screen, and you know that's about it. A lot of mid-tier movies that used to be made are either pushed into one of those two echelons of movie making and they can be very hit or miss usually if they're given too much money they just blow the budget on stupid spectacle visuals that nobody likes yeah or they're not given enough money to make something decent and anything kind of below uh 50 million dollar movie projects like that's now indie stuff and most indie studios are kind of finding it tough to compete in the realm of netflix where if you want to get on netflix you have to meet a certain set of specifications particularly your movie needs to be minimum shot on 4k Mm -hmm. that is a big budget thing to to have to deal with to rent out 4k to edit in 4k indie productions are finding they're struggling as well yeah so it's it's kind of fucked up so that's all my notes did you have any more no i i mostly just wanted to come on here and start praising ronnie cox and yeah kurtwood smith this was the first movie i saw both these actors in so my immediate brain whenever i saw them other things like they're the bad guys because i think i saw billy hills cop yeah it must be billy hills cop one after i watched this and i thought aha he's the bad guy he's gonna turn around and mm. you know shoot axel f no he's still the, the good guy Oh, okay. Oh, maybe in, maybe in the second one, he's going to kill... No, no he's, he's still a good guy. And Jesus Christ, Ronnie Cox is a great actor. <laughs> Out of range. Yeah, so doing a little bit of research, as we do. Yes. The reason these two actors particularly got cast is because they had a reputation for playing nice guy roles. So it was a subversion type cast. Oh, and now, like, Kurtwood Smith is just always playing the kind of well-intentioned asshole. <laughs> and we love him. Yeah, you never know what's going to have the most impact with an audience. And I think a lot of people probably grew up you know, from their teens mm. up watching Robocop. Yeah. So makes sense. I remember when he first turned up in... Well, I watched, like, the first one or two episodes of that 70s show. And I was like, oh, God, it's Clarence Bronica! Yes. And I'm not enjoying this show. But Clarence Bronica's cool! He's pretty great. And now, I hate to say, I, most of my brain uh, with Ronnie Cox is, is Captain Jellico. Yep, same. I highly recommend going onto Twitter and finding the Captain yep. Jellico Twitter account where he's just posting puns all the time. It's, yeah, put that in the footnotes. <laughs> yeah, it's, I love it. I, I must admit, one thing I do love about Monday day internet is where they can take a, a beloved franchise and poke fun mercilessly at it in good jest. Mm. And I think that's why the prequels have actually got a second life on the internet because people are just making all these prequel memes and embracing the absurdity of some of these beloved mm. old franchises. We're going to have to start doing Robocop memes, I think. Yes, we have to do Robocop memes. So, it's under an hour. We're actually under an hour. Holy shit, let's do this. Okay. Um, okay, let's pat it out. Let's pat it out. Uh, what can we talk about? What can we talk about? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, you're not the one editing Jesus this. Christ, man. No, I've uh, I've run out of my minutes as well, and I'm looking forward to start uh, working on the next few minutes as uh taking notes and uh seeing how badly and trying to find out how RoboCop the remake what happened. Yeah. You know, and create our own version that will be infinitely better. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hey, here's a thought so we can pad out time. No, okay. uh, no I was just going to say, we talking about we did talk about the remake, uh, our own remake before. So we mm. cast uh, Michael Keaton as pretty much the Dick Jones character. Yeah. Who would you say would you want to be the Alex Murphy? If we're, if we're having to reboot this, yeah. let's assume that Peter Weller is either too old, not interested, just too, literally just can't physically do Robocop. Yeah. And there has been a history of recasting Robocop. For, yeah. for better or worse, mostly for worst. Mm-hmm. Who would you like to see take on the Alex Murphy slash Robocop role? You know who kind of looks like him? Uh, not off the top of my head. Paul Bettany. Paul Bettany! Yeah. Holy shit, yeah. Paul Bettany as Robocop. He has that face. He has that lower face, doesn't he? Yeah, he's got that oh, intensity. Wow. He's very tall. He's yeah. slender. I think, yeah, that's your guy. He once got to essentially blackballed out of Hollywood until he mm. literally got the job as um, Jarvis. Uh, he was make, He did an interview about that. He, yeah. he had a really big block with a Hollywood producer who threatened to destroy his entire career, and like the next day he got the role as Jarvis. No, he literally ended that conversation yeah, that's with it. the agent. He was sitting outside of the office, got a call from Favreau, like, yeah. hey, do you want to be in my movie? He was like, I don't have anything better to do, so sure. Yeah, I knew it was. It was. I knew it was some time like that. That is a great story because Bettany is a great actor. Oh, I, I, I'm again. Oh Jesus! I just realized the other day how much rom coms I own, because uh, 
Paul Bettany started a movie that things I don't like sports Wimbledon Wimbledon such a great film yeah it's underrated the premise is a little bit ridiculous on Paul Bettany's side but oh my god that's such a great film he needs to be in more stuff well, I wanted to do a Paul Bettany film review series where I just watched every single one of his movies. And I started watching it, and this is years and years ago before mm. I'd done all the movies by minutes and figured out how to just talk to myself in front of a microphone without it being painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I might go back to it because he is seriously underrated. And so he's already got experience playing a robot. And I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm for all for this. So I guess... Wasn't his first movie role a Knight's Tale? Uh, no, well, he'd, he'd done a heap of sort of smaller indie oh, okay. things before that. Yeah. But yes, I think one of his mo- his major... His big major pictures. Yeah, I think that would have been Knight's Tale. That was surprisingly a great film as well. Mm. Anachronistic as fuck. But a fun <laughs> film. I just love that where they just go, fuck it. It's historical, but not really. Um, there's also a show called The Great, which does the same thing. Just, yeah, <laughs> whatever. If it's, if, it's, if it's entertaining, that's the only thing that matters yeah. to me. Um, Context is everything. Mm. So the opening for our Robocop movie, I think, stick to the bloody news program. Yeah, that's why. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Would you cast Monday newscasters? Well, you suggested, I think, Colbert. Oh, I, I don't recall suggesting Colbert, but oh my God, that would be gorgeous. Yeah, I'll just, I'll give you that idea. Yeah. I'll take that idea, but it's not mine. Have Stephen Colbert talk about that. Yeah, because that's the kind of news segment I think we need rather than this mm. whatever Sam Jackson is doing the you know O'Reilly Factor kind of stuff. Who would play off Colbert really nice? It'd have to be a female type. Yeah, so like going for the proper you know TV anchor. What about Amy Poehler? Oh yeah, yeah, that could work. I'm sure they've worked together at some point. Yeah, that would work. Yeah, I love that. Either that or Tina Fey. And they've got the right tone. Oh, Tina Fey, of course. Yeah, yeah, just basically talk about in a way going. The world needs Robocop mm. now. And fortunately, you know, he's disappeared or he was deactivated or whatever. Thankfully, we've got him in a glass cage at the New Detroit Museum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what kind of purgatory is this? Yeah, definitely. I just, this movie is so humorless. Oh, yeah. Is it the whiplash effect that we're kind of making this into more of a comedy? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a direct response of just breathe some life into it. Breathe. Come on, come to life. You know, you have a de- you have to have a defibrillator in that chest with your heart <laughs> that's got connected to your hand. <sighs> I'm never, I'm, I'm never going to not forgive that film for that stupid hand. Never. No. no. Oh, I can't wait till it shows up. <laughs> Oh, it's just going to be an hour of me saying the F word for like, you motherfucker. <laughs> Why is this entire mo- minute beeping? Uh, that's Simon. Thank you, Connor. Uh, it's a pleasure as always. Thank you, Simon. I'm not stealing your line this time. All right. Well, uh, that about covers it. Connor, would you do the honours of telling the lovely people where to find you? You can find me on TraviaDesigns.com, T-R-A-V-A-A-N, or uh, Alien Prequels by Minute on Facebook if you want to listen to my other projects. You're almost finishing uh, Prometheus by now. Yeah, I've got the last six minutes and I'm kind of tempted to just sit down and write all of that out at once and record it all at once because it's, yeah, it's basically five minutes or so. so. Yeah, I, I can't wait to the big finale. I want to see you, like, you know, do this big thing of the entire film and... Or maybe it's just like a 118 minute supercut. Well, I am going to be doing a an audio commentary. Nice. So if you head on over to my Patreon, Travian Designs also, then you can get access to that as well as my Legacy Minute, which is about Tron Legacy, Covenant Minute, obviously Alien Covenant, and then Blade Runner 2049, which is coming soon. You can find me at Fanboy Crossing. Just look for Fanboy Crossing on the internet. I'm on YouTube, I'm on Facebook, book you can also find me on kung pao enter the minutes on primarily on youtube but i'm also looking at other podcasting available services so hopefully we'll have that up as we speak i have ko-fi and patreon but no one pays any attention to that you know give give kind of the money kind of needs more stakes yes thank you very much for listening we'll see you next time